So, all right, thank you everybody for coming by. We're really excited to have all of you. Oh, shocking 64, that's, that's awesome to see the interest you guys have in this. Um, so today we're gonna be hearing from MK Haley from WDI. Um, she is very involved in the academic outreach with Imagineering as well as a lot of uh, teaching experience as well as project management experience. So we're very excited to hear from her. Uh, she'll be telling us a little bit about what storytelling is, um, why it's important to us, and, you know, how we can kind of learn from that um, and apply that in our studies and hopefully our careers going forward. Uh, so with that, I'll let MK take the floor here. Um, take it away, MK. Good day. Thanks for letting me into all of y'all's houses, homes, whatever, parents, offices. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you uh, right off the bat. This is your first meeting for the, the, the group, right? Um, so this is a foundational sort of overview of story, what story is and why humans care about it. And then any topic you hear from here on in, whether it's about engineering or guest service operations, uh, this applies to all of it. So just look at this as a lens through which you can look at everything else. Um, any questions at all? Everyone know how to hit that little blue button and raise their hand? Um, at the bottom of your screen where it says chat, you sometimes have to roll your mouse down there. Um, uh, where it says participants rather, you can click on that and click raise hand to only have a question. But uh, Jacob has built in some time um, for questions. And thank you for noticing my orange birds. I have brought some special guests to talk about story. So I have two orange birds, big orange bird and little orange bird. Um, and then I also have, this is Fred Hayes. This is a Fred Hayes bubblehead. Fred Hayes is one of the astronauts from Apollo 13. So um, the whole Apollo 13 story is an interesting um, evolution of how we looked at NASA because they wrapped story around it. And this is Kid President. I don't know if any of you remember Kid President. He was a ridiculously charismatic child who happened to um, look like Obama when Obama was elected. And he recorded... Um, by the way, there's Kid President merchandise now. Yeah. He recorded a um, pep talk for Obama before he took office that went viral because it was just ridiculously pure and fun. And that one little viral chat that he gave became an industry. So Kid President um, and his uncle now, they're part of Soul Pancake. They do all kinds of videos. They have published two books. One is on how to be more awesome. Um, so who amongst us doesn't need that, right? But, but that's another interesting type of story wrapped around something. So um, for, for sure, everything I'm talking about is from Western civilization. Western civilization and Eastern civilizations have slightly different points of view and approaches to how we tell stories. So the majority of what I'm talking about is from the hero's journey Western part. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen here and get this video up. My, uh... So everyone has control over their own screen, right? Block yourself, mute yourself, raise your volume, lower your volume, whatever you need to do to be comfortable in your own space. Um, uh, just a rule of order that I have for myself. If I have permission to show a video, it's embedded in my presentations. If I don't, I will go out to a YouTube link I have permission to show all the videos I have here for you, but often in my own classes, I will, it looks like I'm awkwardly cutting and pasting and I'm exiting PowerPoint and I'm going to the YouTubes. It's because I don't have permission to present it as my own. So in front of my students, I want to be in here as an example of where you go to the original source. And here's an example where um, we don't have to. Sharing screen. Host has disabled share screen. Enable that host. Let me do that real quick. So we haven't had a chance now. Oh, sorry. We haven't had it happen at, um, I also teach at UCLA. I teach a theme park design class. We haven't had Zoom bombing, but USC has. Um, so a lot of the um, safeties that you're seeing here have been added after the fact because um, bozos will try and zoom bomb you. So the default is that nobody else can share unless the host manually does it. Is it working for you now? Yeah, well, I see um, not my screen. I see all your screens. Oh, there I am. Wow, that was so much. What are you seeing now? 
It looks like it's uh, the editing screen for your PowerPoint there. There you go. So. I have like a mini cave here. So I have like a lot of screens around me. Now do you see what looks like an intro? Yep. Looks great. Game on. Um, so story is a fascinating concept. Um, uh, most um, folks who deal with the study of the brain, human psychology, as well as physiology, will tell you that unless you have a photographic memory, story is the only way that humans actually learn. A, B, C, therefore D, right? Like the oven is hot. What does that mean? I put my hand on it. It was hot. I pulled my hand away. Ow, I learned a thing. Um, and often that's why some folks will struggle with uh, mathematical equations because it's just a, it looks like a random series of numbers. It's not a beginning, middle, end kind of thing that it's easy for us as humans to remember. Um, so it's innate to all of humans, and it's also innate to quite a few mammals, not just humans, um, both tell stories and play. Um, so I do a bunch of different things. Um, I've been in themed entertainment for, um, about, next week is my 26th anniversary with Disney, and I've been in the R&D group most of that time. And I've also helped set up five themed entertainment degree programs. So um, you absolutely do not need a degree in themed entertainment to work in this industry. For you know, 2,000 years, we did it without it. Uh, it's an industry that has hundreds of disciplines. My company alone is over 200 disciplines. Um, but there are some programs now popping up, most in the creative sphere, uh, a couple in the engineering sphere that teach themed entertainment. And what's nice about that is take whatever your discipline is and just put the lens of themed entertainment on top of it, right? I'm an architect. How do I tell stories with my building? I'm a ride vehicle designer. How do I tell stories with that vehicle? So that's somebody who not only understands the engineering, um, but also how do you tell a story? So anyone who's ever designed, you know, a Mustang or a Corvette, they understand both top-notch engineering and sex appeal or story. Um, I also teach at uh, themed entertainment design at UCLA and have set up programs at a few other programs. Um, and I also serve on a lot of boards. And that's one thing that I would recommend highly, obviously, if you're participating in this call, so you've got an interest in something above and beyond your coursework, but Themed Entertainment Association, IAPA are both great for folks interested in this industry. Whatever your major is, there's an industry association for it. And, and I'm not saying you have to, you know, be like Jacob and like set up and run meetings. Just read a newsletter, go to a website. Anything that gives you information above and beyond what other folks have is going to get you more deeply immersed in whatever industry you've chosen. Um, I'm going to make you email me. Um, so this is your first professional networking assignment. You're going to email me and say, ooh, um, your mother load of theme entertainment. That sounds great. Um, so it's really hard to actually find information about this industry. Who's doing what work? What are the necessary skill sets? Where are jobs posted? And so I started throwing them together in this big, ugly Google Doc uh, for my students. Um, never intending for the world to see it, right? That's why it's ugly. Um, but now it's gigantic and it is full. And two thirds of it are gonna be absolute junk to you, but one third is gonna be gold. And that one third is different for everybody. Um, and so we actually have a really supportive community. People love to lecture, they love to mentor young folks. Um, and so you wanna get in the habit of reaching out very professionally. I'm so-and-so, here's what I'm interested in. I see that you've worked on whatever or you're your major is whatever. Can we just talk about that? You never want to open with get me a job, right? That's not anyone but HR's role or recruiting. Um, but people love to talk about what they do. So just start the conversation with them. Um, I also run a Twitter stream that is only themed entertainment related news. Um, you can follow that. I tried Instagram because that's what the kids are using. But Instagram is terrible as a news source, right? So I had to go to the Twitter. Um, and although my career has been with R&D for, um, for all these years, and I have several patents, and my title has been both creative director and technical director. Both my degrees are creative. I have a BFA and MFA in computer animation, and I did a whole lot of work back in the late 80s and early 90s on virtual reality when it started to be a thing. So, so I very much do cross um, disciplines, which has been super helpful um, moving on. And you don't have to be an expert in all of them, right? But just be able to be a thing and talk to the thing on either side of you. So SIGGRAPH is an organization, I'm on the board of directors for them. So if you email me at mk underscore Haley at SIGGRAPH.org, not only will I send you the giant Google Doc of Awesome, and I'm also just gonna send it to Jacob and he will share it with you. But really like, like step up and like send out a nice professional email. Um, and then if there's any questions at all you have, I do about 4,000 resume and real reviews. So if anyone wants help with that, um, just reach out and tap me. Or if you say, I'm not interested in what you have at all, can you connect me to somebody who does blank? 
um, I can connect you to somebody who does Blink. Um, so as I mentioned, we're talking about Western story structure here, and this is most often called the hero's journey. Um, the hero's journey is super, like literally illustrated in Star Wars. So George Lucas took Joseph Campbell, wrote a book called the hero's journey. If any of you have read it, bless your heart, right? Cause it is, it is thick. Like you read a sentence and you're like, what did I read? And you read it again. Um, there is a really nice, much more digestible version written by an author called Chris Vogler called the writer's journey. Um, but it breaks down the three act story structure and the steps that we go through for the hero's journey. Um, it's extremely common. We all understand it, whether we know we do or not. So we have this shared language. And if you want to mess with this story structure, the only way that it works is because we all understood what it should have been. So if anyone saw um, Inception, which was a movie that kind of turned things and messed with time, the only reason we could follow that is because we all knew what it should have been. So there are certain steps to the hero's journey that are very, very specific. Um, Call it, I, I'm just a normal person. And if you think about who are the celebrities in our stories right now, these all follow this to a T. Um, Spider-Man, just a normal person, called to adventure, bit by spider. Harry Potter, just a normal kid, called to adventure. And these characters resonate with all humans, but especially with young children. Young children have no power, right? And anytime they see somebody who's normal like them doing things, it's very aspirational and they want to aspire to that. Um, so rather than me all blah 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 but I'm going to show you a video that this was a student from Iceland. This was his thesis project. He did this little animation explaining what the hero's journey is. Um, and I'm going to also make you sit through the credits because I think it's important to see all the people who worked on it. If you did it, I would want people to see your name. This is the Hollywood guidebook for heroes. You will learn the secret truth behind most blockbuster movies. They basically all follow the same 12 steps, also known as the hero's journey. Every hero's story starts off with some sort of nobody living in an ordinary world. But by following the white rabbit, he will get the call to adventure. At first, he can't be too eager. He must refuse the call. Running away from his destiny, he will stumble upon a mysterious old guy who will turn out to be his mentor. Now he's ready to cross the threshold. Where he's going, he doesn't need roads. Of course, he will be tested, and he might need to win the game to gain new allies and enemies. He must overcome his fear by entering the inmost cave. Here, he will face his supreme ordeal, which will change his life forever. After defeating some bad guy, he'll receive his well-deserved reward. And because he can, he will be flying the road back. But before realizing there's no place like home, our apprentice must resurrect as a new person. Eventually, our hero will return to where he started, but things will never be the same again. This is what we call the hero's journey. So they talked about that in terms of um, movies but it's also the same in traditional literature books it's the same in commercials it's the same in and often you'll have like in video games little mini versions of that cycle happening over and over and over you have a challenge you do the thing you find the coins you earn the whatever you go to the next level so it's a very routine pattern and we're so familiar with seeing it that sometimes we don't see it one of the things i have my students do to really understand story is work their way through a terrible story um, it's a romance adventure board game and it's a choose your own adventure. So like you, you go to this page and you go to this page. So the story is out of order by the very nature of the um, choose your own adventure. And also it's just a terrible story about heaving bosoms and hoping the prince will marry you. And so it's a really great way for students to say, I think, was that a call to adventure? Oh, there's the old guy. You can pull out the pieces um, when it's so obvious. Sorry. This is the Hollywood guy. And also he says 
The cover there says Hero's Guidebook, but that's not, the book actually has a name. It's called The Hero's Journey or A Hero with a Thousand Faces. If anyone wanted to read that thing, it's called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So um, there's lots of ways that we tell a story and purposes for them, very intentional purposes. So one is to educate us or control us to behave in a particular way. I don't know how many of you watch Emergency, which was a TV show from like 1971 to 1975. Anyone? Anyone? It's on Cozy TV every afternoon. Um, so in the late 60s, early 70s, in America, we didn't have 911 or paramedics. If you were in trouble, you called the operator, like you see on Andy Griffith, and, and they connected you to the police or to whoever. And basically, a station wagon showed up, threw you in the back, and took you. And, and most people who had heart attacks died. And there was a doctor here in LA County um, who said, you know, but for a few minutes, these people would have lived. How do we get them to us faster? Um, while he was thinking about this, one state did actually put together 911. It was Alabama, was the first state in the US in 1969. Immediately after that was Alaska, were the first two. Um, but the idea of 911 for help or humans who came to help was completely foreign in the US. So this LA County doctor put together a program of paramedics, EMTs, emergency medical technicians, had to have law changed so that they were allowed to provide you care even though they weren't doctors. And they showed up in these vehicles that were equipped at oxygen and medicine and a phone to call the doctor. And they aired this show. Anyone watching this at home, it was just a regular show that was on once a week, right? And it was, um, who needs to be muted. Um, so what happened was the doctor who wanted EMTs to happen got in partnership with television writers in Hollywood and put this show together to convince California and then the whole country that we needed 911 and EMTs. It's very expensive to fund these sorts of programs and you want the community to say, I want that. And it absolutely worked. Within months, the entire country said, they have that in LA County. I want that where I live and 911 and EMTs went. Nobody watching this knew this. They did not know that that was the reason this was written. Um, but we actually learn, we learned what to do when the firemen show up, stand back, give them room. We learned what, how to take orders from a policeman, um, um, where to stand, put your hands or whatever. Um, we learned, like I, in today's episode that I watched, we learned that foam puts out certain type of fires instead of water. Um, somebody who was very grateful for the EMT service wanted to give them money, and we learned that that wasn't allowed. This is all written as part of a story. It's not like a lecture. Um, and so they were training us on what the service could be, what the potential was, and how we should behave. And that's also the same across all the Grimm's Brothers fairy tales, uh, most of the parables from the Bible. They're explaining to us what society's norms are and how we're expected to behave. Uh, the reason that you don't go out at night is because lots of things might eat you, right? The, the big bad wolf is going to eat you, and that taught you, stay inside. Um, Tribal knowledge and folklore is another reason that we tell stories. We share our origin stories. Every single culture in the world has an origin story. This happens to be Egypt that you're looking at here. Um, and again, it sets the expectation for what we as a community believe. What is our value system? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Um, storytelling is also teleportation, which is really neat. It allows us to go to places that aren't physically possible to go to, either in terms of time, history, or um, fantasy, right? We can go to places that don't even exist. Stories have interpersonal connection. This is a screenshot of the humans in New York. I guarantee you that you have a humans of Notre Dame and a humans of Ohio or wherever you're from. Um, so humans in New York was a photographer who went to New York City to photograph people when he was, he was gonna be successful, right? And, and nobody cared. Nobody was interested in his photos. And he was, he was in trouble, he was on his last dollars. So he started actually talking to people and said, you know, what's your deal? In one or two sentences, he got these ridiculously articulate stories. Um, I'm on my way to school and we're going to learn fractions today and I'm really nervous because I don't like fractions. And like everyone who reads that is like, same kid, right? And so we very quickly connect with each other with very short stories. And what's fun about Humans in New York, it exploded. He now is very famous. But Humans of Wherever is global. If you Google Humans of, like almost every city, almost every college has a version of this to tell the stories of the people in their neighborhoods. Um, Inspiration is also one, or inspiration or aspiration I put together. Um, the story of the uh, little train, I think I can, I think I can, and yes, he did, yay, and we all cheer with him. Um, if anyone has read the Harry Potter series, how does every single story end? There's a great cheer goes up in the hall. They're in the banquet room and they're quaffing their thirst with pumpkin juice and really, there's nothing about that that sounds delicious to me. Um, 
And then we all cheer and because we did the thing. We got through our trials, our, our journeys, and we celebrated. And then persuasion. Stories are actually phenomenal tools of persuasion. If I'm talking to you about a subject matter that you have to analyze and digest, different parts of your brain are activated. Like walls go up and you're like, all right, let me listen to this story about this frog. Oh yeah, okay, great. Here's why I have to save the frog because it's like we have this whole rational thought process. When I'm hearing the story, all your walls go down and you just accept it. You let the story wash over you and it's a really great way to sneak things into your subconscious. Again, to teach you how to behave, to convince you to do one thing or another. Um, so the next slide I'm gonna show you is an ad. And although I guarantee you, none of you have in real life met this person, we all know who this person is because it's part of our shared culture. And he's persuading us to do a really, really hard thing. Felines, 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 felines. Here at Calvary Humane Society, home of the Mutopia Tower of Cats, we are literally bursting at the seams with quality felines. Ready to head home with you today. Black cats, white cats, tall cats, short cats. We've got cats of all makes, models, and colors that are ready to practically walk off the lot. That's right, folks. We've got some terrific cats, and this weekend only we're sending them home for a soul. We're talking two introductions in adults' clubs. Come in and check out our selection of black beauties. This flashy orange number purrs like a kitten. Boasting a top speed of 30 miles an hour, this 40 little number is ready to race home straight into your heart. This Saturday and Saturday only, come on down to Calvary Humane Society to take advantage of our August adoption pricing extravaganza. <laughs> That man is selling used cats. There's nothing on the planet harder to sell than a used cat. Um, so he used a paradigm we all knew, which was slightly sleazy 70s car salesman, um, because that's a trope in, in our storytelling. He had the wide tie and the gorgeous mustache there. Um, but that was local. That Calvary Humane Society was like literally saying, this weekend, come to our parking lot and we'll sell you a cat. Uh, but because it was posted online, it went viral real fast due to its awesomeness. And, um, it, dog and pet adoption through all of Canada skyrocketed um, because it didn't stories travel, right? It didn't, he was, he was talking about one specific thing, but the story resonated across the board. And if you Google used cats or used dogs, many, many humane societies around the world have tried to copy that. The original is by far the best, um, but he's telling a story. Like I have these cars, these cats, and this one purrs like, and we all get it. And we all feel a little smart because we get it, but he gives us the information we need, go to the parking lot on this day. Um, and it resonates with us in a way that would be different than if we just had a poster up that said pet adoption, right? And advertising is really, really good at this, um, particularly during times of um, multi-day events like the Olympics or like the World Series maybe. Um, you'll have a brand advertising, not a particular product, but a brand. So some of the stuff that Procter & Gamble has done in the Olympics is brilliant. They'll have an entire ad series where you don't even know what they're advertising. What they're advertising is how helpful moms are. They're not really advertising a product, but mom got us here and mom uses Tide soap and Pampers and all these other products. So they're connecting right to our hearts and we're like, yes, Tide cares about my mom and I care about my mom. I'm buying Tide. Um, but with a long term event like the Olympics, which happens over several weeks, they have the luxury of growing that story out. Um, and so there's different ways to get me. It can be a poster on a wall, like movie posters album cover art is, is that format story-wise, but then there's also longer options as well. And if you think about how we consume media right now, right, whether it's Game of Thrones or The Mandalorian, right, we binge it in huge chunks. It's hilarious to me to watch a TV show, you know, at two o'clock on a Saturday and they open with, on tonight's episode, because when it was created, it only aired once a week and it was in the evening and they knew you were sitting on your couch with your family at eight o'clock and you hit this channel because that was the only time you could see that thing. Um, and we've drastically changed our viewing habits, how we consume media, and sometimes the stories will morph to, do, to accommodate that. So how we tell stories is, is interesting. For most of millennia, it was an oral tradition, right? We sat around and shared stories. But if you look at these illustrations, there's something very similar. It's, it's cozy, everyone's engaged, often they're gathered around a hearth or, or a radio or something because it is about community. 
um, we moved into technologies to help tell stories. The Renaissance was all about print. The fact that information could be printed and just books were still very expensive, but the fact that you could distribute stories um, had a huge impact on the world. Next came recordings, um, audio recordings first, and you could hear things back. You could hear music from around the world that you had never heard. You could hear people's voices. You could hear the voices of people who are still alive. And that was pretty remarkable. Then we went into movies and you could actually see things from all over the world. Radio actually came after cinema. But if you look, people are still gathered around the same day. They're gathered around as a group looking at this thing. Radio was remarkable because not only did it give us entertainment news from around the world, it gave us live. I could hear somebody on the other side of the planet at the exact same time that they were talking. And that revolutionized how we shared stories and how we communicated. Um, radio was really where serials came from, where uh, once a week you'd hear a little bit of an adventure and they'd say, tune in next week to see what happened to Little Orphan Annie. And oh, they left this called a cliffhanger because Little Orphan Annie was probably hanging off of a cliff. And we had to come back next week and that built up sort of an affinity to the brand. Um, television came next and we got to see images along with the music. Um, and again, it was a very family oriented thing. And one of the things that's interesting about media, no media, like the real story is no media that has been developed that has shared porn, but I'm just going to say stories, no media that has been developed that shared stories was replaced by the next one. Just because we got recordings, books didn't go away. Just because we have movies, um, phonograph didn't go away. So each of these has its own sort of appeal and sticking power. Um, and then the internet. And so what's different about the internet is these other were all push technologies. They gave stories to me. Sure, with radio, I could suddenly hear live things, so I was a little more connected. Television as well, we could air live things. Fred Hayes was on live TV as the Apollo 13 came crashing down. Um, the internet suddenly allows us to participate. It's two-way storytelling. And although two-way storytelling has been around for a while, the real watershed mark in American history, where we all realized collectively as a country, I have a voice, like I can have an impact, I can change the story, was American Idol. We all started watching American Idol and we could vote and what was on TV the next day could be different because of my vote. And now we're sick with power. Now we really presume that our voice matters and it's part of the story. We're no longer sitting back and having passive. We are in many, because don't forget print and media and radio haven't gone away. But a lot of what we presume or expect and storytelling now is that we're an active participant in it and we matter, we can change. It's not just turn a light on, turn a light, you know, it's not just that, a meaningless interaction. It's an interaction that can actually have an, an impact. So if you talk about the economic progression of human beings, um, this is some really interesting research called the economy, the experience economy out of Harvard. Um, we started as hunters and gatherers, right, humans. We went around and we extracted commodities from the earth. We picked things, we hunted things. Then we moved into an agrarian society. We started planting our own crops. We wandered around a lot less because we were rooted because we had vegetables. Then we moved into sort of a shared delivery of service experience. That was the industrial revolution. That's when we started in a large scale making and sharing goods and that changed the economy hugely. The next phase which we're in right now is the experiences stage. Right now, human beings expect and presume there is experience wrapped around the product or good that they're getting. So whether that's customer service, well, and one of the best ways to see this is to look at some of the Amazon.com reviews on terrible products. Um, my favorite is the Bic pens for ladies. Um, like what? Why is that a thing? And, and, and the commentary around it points out very nicely that the experience you're trying to wrap around this, the, the sort of the quality of the brand is ridiculous. But if you think about like Apple products, you can buy your, your iPhone online and have it delivered to your house, or you can get out a sleeping bag and sit outside the Apple store all night. And a lot of people choose to sit outside. It's part of the experience to be part of that cool club. Um, where we're moving next, and there are quite a few examples now, but we're not quite there yet, is transformative experiences and storytelling. Storytelling where we contribute and our contribution makes the world a better place, but in reality, the end product is a better me. So if you think about, um, Bombas, the sock company, where you buy a pair and they donate a pair, that's their entire business model, is that you are a better human being for having chosen this product because it makes somebody up. Tom Shoes does a similar thing. Um, so what, there's a lot of examples we can point to right there. A lot of those are privileged positions. You have to have the money to pay for the more expensive socks. Um, but right now we are squarely in the experience economy. And there's lots of great books on this if you're interested. And it, it hits museums, retail, theme parks, parades, 
sports, everything has an experience wrapped around it. And your experience is the story, the story of the place. Themed entertainment is all about physicality. You know, we're in a physical space. Um, but these, these models hold true for any form of media. So here is what some of the original voting looked like for um, American Idol. And you and your friend became highly communal. You and your friends would sit and watch it together. You would online, you talk about it live together if you weren't in the same room. And you know, you cheer with this controversy. You know, America is enraged at the judge's decision because they're, they're going against me. I had a vote and you didn't agree with me and I, and I mattered in that experience. Um, another really interesting example of experiential storytelling is LARPing. LARPing stands for live action role playing. It hasn't got the coolest reputation in the US, but in Europe, it is badass. Um, you can see thousands of people show up to events. Um, I call LARPing um, collaborative storytelling with rules, right? It, it, there's a, there's a, it's kind of like improv acting, only there's, there's, a, there's not a script, right? but you know your role. You're a wizard and, and you're the, the minister of whatever and you're the person who heals people. Off you go, how might you work in this environment? And um, live action role playing allows you to very specifically be part of the story. You're not just pressing a button to vote, right? You're in this universe. You're smacking a guy in the head with your sword foam. You're having an impact. Um, and this is more and more where we're going. If you think about Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland and Disney World, that, that is LARPing. People are coming in costume. The cast members who are there isn't just somebody who operates a cash register, right? That cast member is playing a role of a particular character who happens to be a merchant who runs stores. And, and this is in response to what human beings are asking for right now. In many ways, people say, oh, that's so revolutionary, Disney, you're leading the way. In many ways, we're following what the guests have already told us. Um, is anyone familiar with Disney bounding? It's an interesting evolution. So recently, well, not recently, a while ago, we, um, we banned adults from wearing costumes in our parks because um, there could always be confusion over, are you Cinderella? Is that Cinderella? Like, who, like we don't want you to impact the quality of the story that we own. Um, and the guests are like, okay, cool. Um, the kid will wear the costume. And um, Disney bounding means I'm bound for Disney. I'm headed to Disney. Guests will dress in colors evocative of character. So if you wear a yellow dress and a red sweater, you Winnie the Pooh. If you wear blue jeans, a red belt and a white shirt, you're Prince Eric. If you wear blue jeans, a red belt and a blue shirt, you're the genie. And so what's interesting is none of these guests care if you get it or not. They're not on stage, not performers for you, like a costume very much is. It's just them and their friends having a moment. And so they're personalizing an experience. You can't build your own theme park, it's very expensive. So how do you personalize or make an experience for you and your friends? And it's fun because you look at guests and you're like, something's going on here. Oh, you're the, you're the ugly stepsisters, right? Like, and you feel real smart when you figure it out, but it's just people sort of paying homage to their favorite characters. They're participating in a way that makes them part of a story in a different way. And all of these trends are moving uh, forward. So businesses especially are orchestrating memorable experiences around interacting with their product, particularly in this day and age when fewer people are going to brick and mortar stores, physical places. How do I have you identify with my brand, right? If you're selling um, soda pop, um, Coca-Cola, by the way, has brilliant marketing. I can show you some of the really amazing stuff they're doing. It's brown bubbly water. And yet they have people connecting and very vigorously defending Coke over Pepsi. Like they identify with the brand and what that brand stands for. And Coke is a very different than Procter & Gale, right? They're not selling soap and diapers. They're selling a lifestyle and a beverage. Um, so you want to make sure that when people see your product, they're like, yep, that's, that's a thing I would do. That's the kind of person I am. People do business with Patagonia specifically for their environmental policies. They make a good coat. Lots of people make a good coat. But Patagonia donates millions of dollars a year to the environment, and, and people respect that. Um, so this next ad that I'm going to show you, um, it took place in South Korea. Um, and, but it doesn't matter if you don't speak the language. You understand exactly what's going on. There's, a, there's an event. All the people in this are actually famous South Korean actors and actresses. So, um, so if you were watching this ad in South Korea, you'd be like, oh, that's so-and-so. And that is appealing, right? Some famous person was at this physical place. Maybe if I go to that place, I'll be cool too. They're showing you their product, which is outdoor gear. Um, what sorts of things might you do in that gear? They show you an example of, well, if you wear this jacket, this is the sort of thing you might do. So they're interconnecting a lot of cool things.
Face has a history of some really fun ads along this line where that that right there was the hero's journey we saw a complete little story arc there i went to this thing it was cool i like this puff jacket it would look adorable on me oh vr that's kind of a lot of people have stuck their head in vr i'll put this tech on that's cool and oh dog sled that makes sense in this coat i might go dog sledding and then actual dog sledding um and then the jacket that they pulled off was the jacket they were looking at. So right there, they had a goal, right? And then when they pull it down, and not everyone got it, they earned it, right? Like they had a challenge, they rose to the challenge, they earned that thing because they pulled it off, and then they had this celebration. Um, uh, souvenirs or artifacts of the journey are important, whether that's a medal that you win at the end of something, or you know the ring that you keep, or the jacket that you keep. A physical artifact is important. And that connects you to this brand in a way that a brand that didn't have this story doesn't. Um, and, and so think about whatever you're doing, how it, that could be the, your end product, right? You're, you're designing a haunted house, right? Like what's your story? How do you engage the guests? But every part of it, how do you advertise that experience? That is a very specific experiential design process. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with the city, right? If you need permits or something like that, that is not just something you do on the side. You have a very specifically crafted story around who you are, why they should support you, um, for my class at UCLA last week, we had um, some baby sheep came to class, because why not? Um, and it was interesting, the, uh, my students are working on an alternative museum tour because we can't go to real museums right now. And so I wanted to give them examples of different types of tours. And we looked at terrible ones. If anyone's done the tour of the Louvre online, it is nauseating. If you hit the left or right button, you go left or right. If you hit up or down, you look at the ceiling or the floor. And I don't know why anyone would ever, um, so I gave them examples of great tours and bad tours. And I have a friend who is semi-retired who is, runs a rescue ranch in San Francisco, like right in the city. He's got sheep and mini two ponies and big ponies. He has nine greyhound dogs from Race Directs. Um, and, and I wanted the students to see a tour is a lot of things, right? It's not just walk here, look at this painting, walk here, look at this painting. Um, and accidentally, this gentleman gave them his whole story. He, if you told him what's your mission statement, what's your story, he's like, I don't have one. But he does. They're all rescues. He only takes rescues. Um, he then sort of re this is kind of a place for them to retire. But also he has two miniature ponies that came to him with all four broken legs. That's not what he harps on, right? But because they were so mistreated, um, they actually behave very nicely around humans. They're great therapy horses. And they don't, they're not locked in a pen anymore. Nobody has broken their legs in a while. Um, but a, sort of a good, a weird good feature of them is that they're very comfortable around humans because of that treatment. So his story is nonprofit, rescues only. He'll keep going until he runs out of space. 
Um, and those are all very specific things he can hang his hat on, right? That's how he runs his organization. Um, he's not going to go to the pet store and buy a pet because that's just not, that's just not his story. Um, and so I, I suggested like, he takes them to local grade schools, the little ponies and the sheep will go visit grade schools. And I said, has it ever occurred to you to do a virtual tour? And it never had. Um, several years ago, um, I was doing some research and uh, New York City had posted 96% um, of the children in the New York City school district had never been to a farm or seen an animal, had seen a farm animal. And so there was a pumpkin patch like 10 minutes outside the city that had developed a farm tour experience for the kids because they didn't know where food came from. And so just even bringing great, and I can tell you, my class lost their minds, right? When we're, we're used to looking at all these little squares of us lined up all over the place, when a freaking sheep pops up in one of those squares, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I actually find interesting about interaction with content is, you know, I have a, 100 students in the class from 46 majors, right? So they come from all over the place. Um, one of the baby ponies was, was wearing adorable boots. Um, and somebody typed in the chat window, oh my God, that horse is wearing boots. And I was like, oh my God, the horse is wearing boots. That's not something they would have said out loud because you don't just blurt that out in the middle of class, right? But it was actually, the conversation became very charming, right? They were talking about how nice he was that he led us on his farm, how, oh my God, that pony was adorable. Um, and just sort of this very positive undercurrent of happy was happening. And I need to think about how can I capture that if we ever get back in person again? Because there's some value to that. Um, and I don't want them on devices right during class, but as much as we think what is happening right now is terrible, and in many ways it is not at all what you signed up for, there are little bits and pieces that we want to think about how do we keep them. Um, so, so this is another really great example. Um, so depending upon what you're building, you have different obligations. If you're doing anything educational, you have an obligation to educate, to be credible. And uh, so that's your zoos, aquariums, libraries, archives. Um, if you're building something totally fanciful, like, like a haunted house, for example, you have no obligation to give me anything credible. That's all about fantasy. So the story for educational places, uh, and this is a thing I've invented and I would like you to help me make it go viral. Make me aware, make me care, give me a call to action. Make me aware of what is going on. These astronauts are traveling to the moon. By the time Apollo 13 happened, America kind of was over space travel. They didn't broadcast it live. They may or may not have had anything about it in the news except the day they took off and landed maybe. After being consumed with space, the space race and optimism, we kind of didn't care. So make me aware, these guys went to space. Make me care, uh-oh. Their capsule was busted. They had to get in the jettison pod and escape back. And you bet your bippy, every single American was glued to their radio and TV watching whether or not these guys could come back. Um, they had to do some amazing puzzle solving to fix the capsule to get back. There's this famous scene in the movie. This is the movie that Tom Hanks was in. Um, there's this famous scene in the movie where they just, in uh, Houston, they dump everything on a table that they know is in the capsule, including they each have two pairs of socks. They have meal trays, they have this wire thing, so they could build a filter. Because um, what they realized, too late, the filters in the capsule and the filters in the main vehicle weren't the same, so they weren't interchangeable. That is not an issue anymore. Um, and then give me a call to action. So once they came down safely and America was all happy, the call to action was, we need to be better about funding space and talk about why it's a value. So especially if you're running um, an educational place. So who's familiar with Fiona, Fiona the hippo? I mean, yeah, Dylan knows her. Fiona is ridiculous and she's awesome and she has skyrocketed both attendance and funding to the Cincinnati Zoo. So she was born, she's probably about two years old now. She was born way too soon, she was a preemie. And in the history of hippos, no hippo born her size had ever lived. So the first thing they did was take her away from her mother because her mother didn't know how to care for one that tiny. The very dangerous thing they did was live stream her life very well millions of humans could have watched Fiona die on webcam. She didn't, um, but we learned how to feed her. We learned at what point it was healthy to give her back to her mom. We learned about conservation efforts. Um, pretty sh around the time she was born, there was another, um, another hippo named Henry who was born at Animal Kingdom in Florida. And the internet was mad, like, you should date, you should be boyfriend and girlfriend. 
And Henry, who now has his own Twitter account, had to say, oh, hold up, I'm actually her uncle. Um, so then we had a really good conversation about how zoos manage species and, and interbreeding that. And so her boyfriend now, she has a boyfriend, his name is Timothy, and he's from the San Antonio Zoo in Texas, and he tweets her every day at 3 p.m. And like thousands of people are online waiting to hear what Henry's going to tweet her. And so for her second birthday, he sent her an edible arrangement because he's very romantic. Um, and they also point out she, they're, they're both just babies, right? Like they're not going to date until they're older, but they've developed this whole story around them. They've, they've hugely anthropomorphized them, right? They've put human realities on them, but it has caused a huge influx of cash to the, to the zoo. And people suddenly understand and care about these animals in a way that allow them to connect. Um, Turtle Talk with Crush, which is on the right there. That's an interactive experience at um, Epcot Center in Florida. And uh, Turtle Talk, he's telling me, I'm a turtle, I live in the sea, it's a character that we might already know, so we might feel something for him. Before we leave, he gives us a few tips. Make sure your garbage doesn't go into the ocean, because I might eat it. Um, be good to the ocean, will be good to you. Just these tiny little calls to action. But children especially leave feeling empowered, because the idea of tigers going extinct is terrifying. Like, no three-year-old can solve that, right? And they feel the pressure of, things are bad and I can't help. If you give them one tiny thing, recycle. Suddenly, they feel like, I'm going to recycle. And you bet your bippy the rest of the day, and they will make sure that everyone in the family recycles. Um, so just these little hooks as to how am I connected to the story, and then how can I be maybe a part of it or help be part of the solution um, are real simple. Uh, the upper left there is a ridiculously fun game. I don't know if anyone's played Wilderness Explorers in Animal Kingdom. Um, so Animal Kingdom is, is not a zoo. It's a conservation place, right? And it's got attractions and shows and animals. And what people do is, you know, park opens, rope drops, and they run right to the roller coasters, which we have trained them to do. Um, and they zing right by all these amazing exhibits with animals. We have hundreds of docents in the parks who are subject matter experts who can tell you about the animals, the plants, the culture, and the guests are just blown by them. So one of my friends pitched this Wilderness Explorer campaign. Um, Russell from Up is a Wilderness Explorer, so we're tying into that storyline, where you go around the park and you answer questions and you get this information, you get a little sticker, a badge to get in your book. There was almost no cost because the docents were already there. They just were being ignored. Just the cost of the book and the stickers is all we had to add. And the docents don't give everyone the same question. If you're an adult, you get a much harder question. Um, very few people go through the park doing this, right? As they go through the park, anyway, they'll do one that's here and there. Um, but as you exit the park and do guest surveys, it's the single most popular thing in the park. It's a huge guest satisfier because guests learn things, they feel smart, they earn badges, you know, they have that complete hero's journey um, arc. And the woman who pitched this, nobody was interested, right? They were building Animal Kingdom, they were busy, and she's like, you guys, it's really cool. And they're like, uh, Expedition Everest, big things. So she actually built a version, mocked it up, and put it in our building, our main building at Imagineering, and made all the creative executives play it in the building. And they're like, oh, you know what? This is actually very cool. So it won that year the Themed Entertainment Association Award for the best attraction in the world under $2 million of the year. And Joe Rohde made her go pick it up. He's like, I literally laughed at you. That is your trophy, lady. And she got to go up on stage and get the trophy. Um, but it was very easy and it was nice to use the things you have. Some other places where really good story is happening and it's not accidental. It happens because the person on the other end is prepared. So uh, Twitter wars, polite Twitter wars, so there's this thing called ask a curator, happens once a month anyhow around the world. Some curators just sitting at the terminal waiting for you to ask them a question. So the um, Museum of Natural History in London happened to be hosting it this day. And some rando asks, hey, Natural History Museum of London, if you were only using items from your collection and you got into a battle with the Science Museum, which is next door, who would win? And it was on. There was a phenomenally glorious three hour Twitter war, very polite, right? Because they're British and they're academics but using only items from their collection. So the Natural History Museum, you can see here, opened with dinosaurs, no contest. Science Museum uh, rebutted with, um, that's just an old fossil. We have Spitfires, which is a, a jet fighter with bombs. And, then it, and then, it, then, it, then it was on. Natural History Museum ran back to some room and came out with a giant locust buggy looking thing in a case. And they're like, we got this. Um, so we're seeing things in the collection that aren't normally on display. We're having conversations about these objects that we might not always talk about. So, of course, in response to the bugs, the Science Museum came out with Wellingtons, which is a famous boot 
to stomp your bugs. And then the Natural History Museum came back with lava and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and how it ended was the Victorian Albert Museum, which is also right there. There's a row of museums in, in London. The Victorian Albert Museum said, can we all just get along? And everyone said, okay, they all get along. But totally organically, right? Not scripted at all. This lovely conversation that was an opportunity to show that they had personalities and that they featured items from the collection kind of evolved. Very true to their stories, right? They talked about natural history objects or, um, or science objects. And I mean, nobody directly threatened to kill the other guy a little bit when they said, we'll throw lava on you, but, um, but it was done in good fun. And, and there's lots of examples of, of these different types of mediums that we have. And as technology changes, you know, our need for storytelling hasn't changed, but how we tell it is different. So Modern Family did a really interesting episode where the entire episode was told from device screens. Um, so this is what you're at home. When you looked at it, this is what your screen looked like. It was an iPad or an iPhone or desktop computer. And one of the children was lost. The episode is called Connection Lost. And so we're all, did she go to Vegas to get married? Did she whatever? And so there's all this confusion, some things that happen very commonly when we're using devices. People are like freezing up and you're not getting the full message. And it absolutely worked. We all understood because we've all had, you know, we've all had, particularly now, we're talking to our parents right through a device like this. Um, and it completely worked. Um, the next one here, Lizzie Borden Diaries is interesting. So this is a modern version of Pride and Prejudice. It was put online as short, just a few minute video blogs of this woman named um, Lizzie Borden. It's Lizzie Bennett. Lizzie Borden is the woman who took an ax and gave her parents 40 wax. She's a different famous New England character. Um, so uh, um, the gentleman who did this is really interesting. So um, his name is Jay Bushman. And he, he worked with me at Disney. He was in charge of what's called the last mile, which is getting the satellite data to your house. It's actually fairly easy to get satellite data from a satellite to space, I mean, from the office to space and then back down again. The last mile to your house is, is hard. So he was in the basement of the Disney Channel building and he just loved media. Um, he did this project called um, the Spoon River Anthology. And in 1900, if you were in grade school, this was mandatory reading. In 1900, the Spoon River Anthology was the number one most popular book in the US. And it's a very weird story that's told through the epitaphs on gravestones. So by reading these stories, like you broke my heart and now I'm dead. And then this guy four rows over, he has something about you were the love of my life. What did I do? Like you can connect these stories together, but it was paper and it was a lot of page flipping and interconnecting and to your own adventure kind of stuff. So he spent years digitizing that story and putting it online so you could follow through lines, like you could click on Lucad's hoarding there and see his whole story would follow up, like who were his parents and what was the story through. So you could slice the content a number of ways. And this was the promise of digital storytelling. You know, we had access to different things. We could look at it with different lenses. We could translate it. This was his baby and nobody cared. Number one book in 1900. In 2013, nobody gave a rat's ass about the Spoon River Anthologies, and he was heartbroken. Meanwhile, he's at um, South by Southwest, which is a conference in Austin, and they're in hotel lobby drinking his team. His team was six people, and they just started chatting, and he said, what if we reenacted the trench run in Star Wars where they run and drop the bomb into the hole over Twitter? Like, what if the radio communications they have in that scene, we actually tweeted to each other? And, and particularly with beer, that was a hilarious idea. So they immediately start, the six of them each take a character, they fight over, because nobody wants to be Luke, because Luke actually doesn't have very many lines in that scene. Um, so they start with the tweeting, 140 characters or less, but the rest of the world doesn't know that this is happening around a table in a hotel lobby in Vegas, in Austin. And they join in. And nobody tried to bomb it, right? Like everybody who joined in really did it with credibility, like they respected what was going on, they picked a character, it might be an invented character, Squadron Leader 7, right? But they really enhanced and continued the story. And this went on for like two hours. Um, and that was amazing. It wasn't that fun. The next day, they were in Variety Magazine and George Lucas called Jay. And he's like, great. Here's my life's worth of work over here. The Spoon River Anthology. Nobody cares. I do this thing in a lobby in three hours and now I'm famous. Welcome to Hollywood, babe. So he actually did the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, the one on the page ahead, which was a modern way to interpret Pride and Prejudice from Jane Austen. Um, he left Disney and started his own company where he does interactive media, where 
something like Lost has content, and then there's this whole online world that you do that either enhances it or supplements it. He won the world's first Emmy for interactive media, and now he has a giant company um, that does allows you to have this enhanced content, which is a new or different way to tell stories. Um, and if you think about even more emerging technology, um, AR allows an overlay into a world. And one of the things that's nice about these technologies is how quick they can pivot. So in advertising Pokemon Go, one of the features when it came out was, you know, go outside, explore the world, do these shared activities with your friends. And then coronavirus happened and nobody was doing any of those things. They pivoted on like a, in like a week and made a version for your home. They understood that you were home and they understood like what might be a block or so around your house because it's geolocation sensitive. And they recreated the experience so you could still hunt your Pokemons depending upon what your reality was right now. And that's not something you could do with a printed book, right? Or, or even with the movie, you know, you'd have to edit it and re-release it. Um, so there, there are opportunities there for interaction and storytelling that are dependent upon the outcome. Um, VR is really interesting because of, different than story watching and participating, it's story living. Like you really do feel scared. You really feel a sense of presence in VR that you don't feel elsewhere. This is a really interesting example of a video game that was developed, a virtual experience for kids getting shots. So there's this little character here. Um, there's a bad something happening. We're collecting a crystal and the character comes up and he puts an ice cube on your arm, a virtual ice cube. And so on your arm, right when he puts the virtual ice cube, which your body interprets as cold, right? Because it thinks it's an ice cube. That's right when the doctor gives you the shot. 100% of the kids in this experience do not know they got a shot. They, they think they felt the sensation. They, their brain said cold and they said, oh, ice fairy ice cube. And then they took off the H&D and they're like, when's the shot happening? Um, so there's a story there, but it's wrapped around, you know, persuasion. It's wrapped around making you think or feel a very particular way. And this, of course, will evolve into a lot of different possible futures and you all the ones who are going to design this. Um, so some of the, the points here are stories and good stories are consistent that they all reflect shared desires we have. Most of these desires though we tend to keep secret. Um, stories really revolve around that we want to be loved but we want to be loved for who we are not just random love but we want to be able to keep our own identity and be respected and appreciated for that. We want to be something more than we are. That's the whole hero's journey. I'm, a super, I'm still me, but I'm a superhero in some regards. We want to be able to play in places I can't go because they don't exist or they're too far away or it's another part in time. We want to suspend reality, distance, and distract ourselves into these alternate realities. And most importantly, we want to share these places and spaces with other people. These are very communal sorts of experiences. We want to hear a story and tell a story. We want to include our friends. We want to evolve stories over time to include my point of view. Um, and so what's interesting about next-gen storytelling, what we're doing now, is it involves massive collaboration. Lots of different people contributing at different points, like that Star Wars um, example. Um, and we are continuing to invent ways to tell stories and interact with each other as we tell those stories. Is anyone here playing that island game? Oh, what's it called? Where you're selling radishes? Animal Crossing? Animal Crossing, that's the one. Like, look at how quickly that exploded. Um, now that we're all at home and doing nothing and how much it matters that I show off what I've designed to my friends. I look, I made myself a cute little hat. Look at, I've recreated Disneyland, which is in there right now. Um, I'm going to sell you a rutabaga. You're going to sell me whatever. That would not at all be the same experience if I couldn't customize it, right, to re represent myself and what I care about. And if I couldn't share it with my friends. Um, so that is storytelling. And one of the nice things about emerging technologies is it keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. These low cost tools allow people an entry into universes they could never participate in. Like it wasn't that long ago that you had to be really wealthy to film a movie and distribute it. Now you can film a movie on your iPhone and distribute it on YouTube for free. And so this sort of democratizes the process and allows a lot of different types of people. It means there's also a lot of junk out there, right? But it allows other folks to, an, an entry point into being able to tell these stories and participating in this larger universe. And what's really interesting about this is that that is all you. If you think about the major business innovations of recent times, um, Facebook, Airbnb, Uber, those were all invented by college kids who suddenly had access to tools and technology to develop it. Like taxi systems not working for you, I'll invent Uber. Um, and so think about that when you move forward. You're not just a consumer of these experiences. Um, you are very much a creator um, and have opportunities to solve problems or invent brand new options. Um, I, I'm really curious to see 
in the event that we can ever go back to seeing each other in person, which bits and pieces of our new existence come with us? Do we like immediately go back to, whew, thank goodness, old days are back? Or, or do we keep some of these shared technologies together? Do we have family dinners more often than we used to? So that's like a high level. We could spend an entire semester just talking about story and the psychology behind it. But I wanted to give you sort of a layer, a foundation to build off of every other um, part of the work that you do over this summer for themed entertainment, story building, guest experience, customer service. How can you wrap story around it to help get your mission across? Um, and also to make the other person you're interacting with feel included and feel important in that process because that's the best way to bring somebody to your side. Um, one of my favorite projects that one of our students at Carnegie Mellon did was um, Peacemaker, it was called. And the, the goal of the game was to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And you had to get Palestine and Israel to talk and be friends. Um, and they took it to Palestine and Israel and had teenagers play it. Now, nobody swapped sides, right? But more and more they'd say, oh, that's why they're so mad. I didn't understand that that's why they were so mad at me. And that's just a start of the conversation, right? And when they asked um, um, the gentleman who made the game, who owns his own company now called Games for Change, um, they asked, like, why did you build this? And he said, there's plenty of first-person shooters out there. I didn't see a single game about peace. So one day at the university, he gets a letter from the Nobel Peace Prize Foundation, and he's all excited, right, because he's a letter. And it was a cease and desist letter. It was a letter saying you have no right to use the words Nobel Peace Prize. So you live, you learn. Um, but just think about like what, what your point of view is, where you're coming from, and what you care about. And don't say it doesn't exist. People might not want it. Say, oh, there's nothing like this out there. Of course, that's why people want it. Now it's time for all the questions. Jacob will manage this. If you raise your hands, I'll call on you. All right, Zoshi, let's uh, hear from you there. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, Zoshi, wanted... my friend, she follows me on Twitter. I do, and I bookmark so many of your links because they're all really helpful. It's always great to log into Twitter at the end of the day and see all of the stuff you posted for the day. Definitely check it out, guys. Thank you for joining us from, well, I don't want to presume San Diego. You could be anywhere. I'm actually in Burbank right now. <laughs> Burbank. Let me go wave out my window at you. I'm in Glendale. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, I guess I just had a quick question about theme. And so uh, we had a TADCC had a talk a few weeks ago with Richard Proctor. And he talked about like, when you lose sense of the story, always revert back to the theme. Yep. Um, and I was wondering if you could go over like theme and story a little bit. Yeah, and so Joe Rohde talks about this much better than I do. Um, again, if, if you email me and, and ask, I'll send you a horribly scanned PDF of a magazine article. He's also done a few lectures that are on YouTube that separate these out. So um, a story is a structure, beginning, middle, and end, three act, hero journey. Theme is what's the underlying motivation for everyone in there. So if you think about Frontierland at Disneyland, um, the theme, which is why we're a theme park, the theme is man's overcoming nature. The man westward ho, like humans exploring and going west. How is that man? Like, how does that play out? Oh, we go to the west and we ride horses and we mine gold and, and we dig a well and, and, and we have a gunfight with my neighbors, right? So the, the story is the pieces and parts that make up beginning, middle, and end. The theme is the motivation for everybody in the story. Sorry, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Zochi. Do we have any, uh, any other questions out there? Lauren, go go ahead. Um, hi. Um, so, I was wondering. You had mentioned previously that. Um, sorry, there we go. You had mentioned previously that um, there were some like awesome like alternative museum tours that. Um, yes. Been sharing with your class, I didn't know if you could touch upon a couple of those. Like, what's your been your favorite you've seen so oh. far? Oh, oh, do I have a giant Google Doc that has collected them all? Sure. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, so I was lucky I guess and that we're on the quarter system so those of you who got screwed up in the middle of your semester so sorry um I had to do my last week of a 10-week quarter virtual um which was which was easy right we were just reviewing final projects before they they and pe you could email me you could be online like I had a hundred ways to connect with me but then I had all of finals week and spring break to completely reimagine my class as a virtual experience um and every year the students do a big hack the museum 
tour where they reimagine um, using gaming methodologies how a museum tour might go. And UCLA has a lovely sculpture garden that they use because it's outside, they can access it 24 seven. My class is half in the daytime and half in the night, so everybody go flashlight because whatevs. And I'm like, oh, well, we can't do that. So what does a virtual museum tour look like? So just over spring break, which was eight weeks ago, started collecting all these examples of virtual tours in a Google Doc, and now it's huge. And so one of the first things the students had to do was go through a few of them, two or three, pick whatever I want to sign it to you, and, and pull out what works and what doesn't and why. So the first ones, so there was a huge spike, like May 10th to May 30th, there was a millions of spike of people interested in taking virtual museum tours because we we're stuck at home, didn't know what to do, educators especially. So um, some of them are pretty high quality. So the Louvre in France is, is like, just like you walking through it. It's a virtual representation of you going down the hall, look at the thing, go upstairs, very much what you might expect if you were there in person. Um, uh, Natural History Museum in, in New York is actually more of a graph thing. When you load it up, it's a big chart and you see dots and you can go anywhere in time or anywhere in theme. So you can go Native American 1600 and click that and that brings up content. So that's a different way to navigate the space. So there's different ways to do it. You can just click on video and have a curator tell you about a thing. Um, but my favorite, so all of those so far are recreating a real experience if you had been there personally, which is fine, right? That's what some people expect. But my first like out of left field one that showed up, um, the Smithsonian put out a call to museums around the world. What's the creepiest thing in your exhibit? Oh, yeah. So they, they created, they curated a collection of creepy stuff that wasn't all in the same place. They could create an experience with stuff from all over the world because it was virtual. And let me tell you, there's some seriously creepy stuff out there. Half mermaid, half babies. Um, and that was fun. And they would never have done that, right? That would not have come up as a topic except for that we're all stuck at home and desperately trying to figure out how to homeschool our children. Um, and so I have a gigantic listing. And as I was collecting this, I also came across cool stuff people are teaching me. So not a museum tour, but hey, Disney artists once a week are teaching me how to draw characters. So one half of the document is museum tours and the other half is nifty random stuff people are teaching me. Um, the one Animal Crossings, um, they have a filter where you can create a gallery and plop your own artwork into it. So you can create a tour of your own stuff. So you're walking through a little house you built. Oh, and there's a painting on the wall that your grandson did and there's a picture that you took. So tools are developing to build these and customize them. Um, so I'll send you the link to that and you can just enjoy it. A lot of them are like 20 great museums. So there might be some redundancy in there, but mm -hmm. hopefully there's Yeah, a that'd be great um, just to like see the range of stuff that's out there from all over. Right, and also I'm, I'm interested in stats on how long are we interested in this? Do we suddenly not care once the summer starts or do we extra care because suddenly all these kids summer camp activities were canceled. So the demographic usage of this um, and even like, it, like, let's pretend the usage does fall off. At least it's there. Now there's a resource that didn't used to exist. And museums right. and aquariums, by the way, are the number one visited thing in the world. Uh, so, that, you know, more than theme parks, more than national parks, theme parks and um, museums and aquariums, um, people love those. And so there is an interest to follow what happens in these spaces and to design to make these spaces accessible. Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, next up, it looks like we have Jessica. Hi. Um, I was wondering, what made you decide to enter into the themed entertainment industry? Did you have any childhood influences? Did you wake up one day and decide, hey, this is something cool I wanted to do? Where did you get so, started? So fun fact, no. Um, and, and I actually feel badly because there's people who are like, since I was four, I've wanted to work in Imagineering. I was hired by Imagineering before I had ever been to a Disney park in my life. And so for a long time, I had to get over I'm not worthy, right, because I didn't want this. I'm a kid from Massachusetts. I'm just, I'm physically very distant. I'm from a family of 20 children. So we just didn't go on vacation, period, right? And nor did anyone in my neighborhood. It's not like I even knew what it was. My friends and schoolmates didn't go to these places. Um, I moved out here to California to go to grad school. And my school was invited to do Imaginations, which is a student design competition Imagineering runs and nobody was doing it, and my dean was mortified. And he says, just, he's like, just whip, it doesn't have to be good, just whip anything together and submit it so that we look like we participated, then next year we'll get our act together. Um, so having never been to a theme park in my life, I just whipped something up. Um, I didn't win the contest, I was runner up in the contest, but I won the internship that was on the table. And here's how my interview went. First of all, the guy was smoking, because <laughs> it was the early 90s during my job interview. And the guy says, let me get this straight. You're an art major who can beep and code on a Unix box. 
and I have my new suit, my portfolio, right? I'm ready to go. I said, yes, sir, I am. And he says, okay, can you start tomorrow? Best job interview ever, been there 26 years. <laughs> By the way, the interview process is much more rigorous now. Um, but it was like, it was totally insane that in the early, late 80s and early 90s, I had a degree in virtual reality as an art major that I could code was, was very rare. Um, and uh, so we had a team of nine of us interns who were picked. We relocated to Florida and ran the Aladdin Virtual Reality Lab. So not only did we run that guest facing, but we also did a lot of research. We did 75,000 surveys on um, what guests liked, what they didn't like, did they understand how to use VR. That research was all published in 1996 and the rules haven't changed. Right? If you're interested in building a virtual experience, we have published really great data on the Aladdin VR ride um, that is still used today as best practices. So I had no interest in this field whatsoever. Somebody said, you want to start tomorrow? And I said, okay. That's a terrible, that's a terrible aspirational journey story, but that's how it, that's how it went. <laughs> Incredible story nonetheless though. Uh, so we'll take just a few more questions here. One from the chat is, uh, says, I've just started to get serious about wanting to get into themed entertainment. Great timing, right? Uh, yeah, I specifically sorry. have experience with VR, game development, theater lighting, SFX, uh, and I was wondering what can I do during the summer to learn more about internships or jobs in the theme entertainment industry? So, so one thing that's, first of all, all of y'all should, all y'all, I lived in Florida for four years and I picked up some of the lingo, um, bless your hearts. Um, you should all have done the Imagineering um, workshop, the, uh, the Imagineering in a Box activity. So it's on Khan Academy, it's free. It's a multi-part workshop that walks you through the theme entertainment design process. Um, it's actually been around for about a year and a half. It had some traction, mostly theme entertainment fans, but once everybody was in lockdown, it exploded and families are doing it together. So walking through that is just a really great, it doesn't make you a better special effects designer in art. It makes you better attuned to what this industry's processes are. Um, and for this summer and probably next fall, your dream job doesn't exist. You are absolutely not getting a dream job. So those of you who still have internship applications pending, they will probably be canceled or rescinded. So now is an opportunity to get experience anywhere. Any experience is good. So I worked for 10 years um, in nursing homes and hospitals. My specialty was male quadriplegics, most of them Vietnam veterans. And I just did that to pay for college, right? I wasn't in med school, I wasn't in nursing school. And it is really remarkable how much that still influences my design process. I'm the first one in the room to say, you can't see over that hedge in a wheelchair. And people will say, how did you get? And I'm like, oh, because I spent 10 years of my life with people in wheelchairs. Um, so if you're working at Starbucks, right? Are you working with money? Are you working with customer service? Do they trust you with the key at the end of the day? All those things really matter. There is no experience that is not useful. Um, so throw yourself at whatever the heck is going on. Are you a driver for, for amazon.com or food service? Um, that matters, right? Your, your customer service matters. Like we all have people showing up to our house and which ones do you remember and which ones you don't. Um, so I will also, I will do a resume and a real review for anyone if you want to send it to me. You do need to talk in a particular way um, to be understood in our industry. It's less talk, more do. I don't want to see, I want to see action words. I want to see what you've done, not what you, because people will say hardworking, aspirational, go-getter. That's how you do a thing, not what you do. I need to know what you do. 3D modeler with expertise in low count polygons for real time gaming or VR. I know exactly what chair you will sit in. I know who you'll sit next to. So give me something very actionable. Um, and if you are from theater, film or television, you're gonna actually have to have two resumes. One for your industry, because man, if you've never seen a theater resume, it's bonkers. Um, but that doesn't communicate really well in our world. So you need a different one, same data, but just formatted in a different way to communicate to our world. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll help walk you through that. Every one of you needs a LinkedIn profile. So if you think of your LinkedIn profile as a database of your entire life, every job you've had, every volunteer service, every medal you've won, every club you're a member of, uh, and then you cut and paste from that for a resume, a resume is a two minute ad for you for a particular job. Um, so if you've done a lot of work as a lifeguard, that may not be relevant to the effects work you're doing. But if you were a runner in a game company, that is. So just cut and paste um, for whatever best tells your story. Awesome. And also, I know a lot of students who are graduating right now who had their summer internships rescinded and they immediately pivoted and they're going to grad school. Like in March 1st, they weren't going to grad school or on April 1st, they are because they're like, my summer job is gone. I don't know what the fall looks like. Like, will classes will be remote. Will they happen at all? Um, will there be internships if I graduated? So um, that's, a, that's not a trivial 
decision, right? But I've seen a, a spike in grad school applications. Thanks for that advice. We're going to take two more questions. The first from Jared. Um, we're just going to speak this one out loud for us. I see your lips moving, Jared. I don't hear anything coming out of them. Are you there, Jared? I think. Yeah, he just muted himself. He was unmuted, but he muted himself. You can type it in the comment window. Yeah. Oh, he's, nope. he's typing right now. He's typing. We'll take the second one, and then we'll come back to Jared's mm -hmm. afterwards then. So this one is from Alec. Um, you should be good to speak there, Alec. Yes, hello, can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for um, your talk, MK, that was fantastic. I couldn't um, be more excited that your last name is Bornak, because I have, if you could see on that shelf, a massive Golden Girls collection. That's, so my dad worked on the show and they named it after him. So, because like the person liked, liked my dad or whatever. So that- I, that's I, have, I have a mask, I have a coronavirus mask that says, thank you for being a friend and has the girls on it. Oh, that's fantastic. I'll tell them about that, that's awesome. Um, my question is specifically about, I, I love this, this talk on storytelling and all the different things to keep in mind. What do you think is the most important thing to keep in mind when transmit, tr kind of transmitting storytelling to a physical space for a themed entertainment? Like what, what are things that we should keep in mind during that process? So there's a lot of things in the world that we absorb unconsciously in direct control, right? Like we all think we're in complete control when we go into a store and go to this rack. No, you are not. That store, that store is very well laid out to guide you. Not 100% of the time, but almost 100%. Same in video games. Why do you take the path right instead of left? Because it's very well designed for that. And there's lots of tools and techniques to do that. That's a whole other lecture I have in my hard, my hard drive here. Um, but one of the things that is interesting about physical spaces is that they tell the same story. So I don't know why, Alec. I've knocked you unconscious. You're lying flat on your back. You pop up. You're in Dodger Stadium. How do you know you're in Dodger Stadium? There's no sign. If you're lying on the pitcher's mind, there's no sign. But there's grass and there's bleachers and there's lights, right? You know, it's not a little league field. There's all these social and physical cues and you know how to behave. If you woke up in a church or a library, you would behave very differently than if you woke up in a mosh pit. Um, before anyone told you what the space was, there's all these dimensional cues. And if they're not there, it's called in inconsistent theming um, and or a thematic inconsistency. And for me, some of those are, there's some places in Disneyland where the monorail line runs right through Fantasyland. And it's like a little jarring because that shouldn't be there. And that's a thematic inconsistency. So it's super obvious when it doesn't work. It's invisible when it does. Um, one of the reasons we shroud digital cash registers in Frontierland is because a digital cash register doesn't belong in Frontierland. So we hide it under something. I once saw um, Peter Pan holding hands with Alice skipping through Frontierland. And I was all like, what? Like none of you belong here. You don't belong together but I hadn't realized how much I believed I was in that space until one thing pulled me out of that space. And that's a common theater reality. It's called suspension of disbelief that I believe. I, we all know old yellow didn't really die. He was an acting dog, but we still cry, right? We all know how Apollo, let's see how many times I can mention Apollo 13. We all know how Apollo 13 ended, they lived, but you're still on the edge of the seat and you're still crying when you think Tom Hanks is gonna blow up. Um, and that's because it's a very believable world. So think about what things in those worlds tell the story. Because Frontierland is for sure not an accurate representation of the Wild West. There's no porta potties. There's no horse dung in the streets. The streets are hard packed, not sand. So it's not a, it's not a historical recreation. You know, it's not a living museum. We're picking and choosing the stereotypes, basically, of these places that help tell that story. Um, if anyone's ever been to Epcot and you think about how the pavilions are designed. The French pavilion is very specifically one part of Paris at one point in history. Next door to it, the UK pavilion is four countries over 500 years. And next to that is Canada, which is the entire of Canada. Like can you think Canada, big, vast, wide, that's what the pavilion is. It is actually west to east coast. It covers the flower gardens, the Rocky Mountains, the architecture. So those are three pavilions that tell a story of a physical place in three separate ways and no place is right. But it's just an issue of making sure I have the right amount of cues and clues as to where I am and how I should behave and how I behave impacts how other people behave. Thank you. And there's in my Google Doc of Awesome, which one of my students just renamed the source of all sweetness, I'll also accept that. Um, there's some good reading references on that as well. 
Awesome. Uh, so it looks like Jared's uh, has typed his question up here, so I'll read that out loud. Uh, mm -hmm. First, thanks for joining us. You mentioned that though this time is tough, there are certain things we can take and apply once the pandemic is over. How do you think it might shift industry storytelling techniques, including the technologies involved? So I think we're going to care a lot more about connecting. Now that we are not connected, we desperately crave it. Does that mean we're all 100,000 of us going to cram into a stadium? Hopefully not. Um, but we will start using these tools and technologies to connect in new ways. Viewing parties have become huge. If you think about some of the stuff we're seeing on TV, celebrities doing virtual concerts, uh, Disney has two sing-alongs, um, and those are things that connect the community through our technology. Um, Facebook has virtual viewings. You know, you and your friends can all watch the same thing together. That didn't exist a month ago. And so we're very quickly using um, existing technologies in new ways, and I don't think those will go away. And also think about what's happening in movie theaters, right? Um, Artemis Fowl drops digitally. Um, it's on Disney Plus, right? So you don't have to pay extra for it unless you're, if you're a subscriber. Trolls, um, which was released digitally, earned more money, I think, in three days than the original earned in three months in the theater. That is revolutionizing how movies are thought of. And so then what happened? AMC lost its mind and said, Universal, we're never yeah. showing another Universal picture again in the history of ever. Universal is 25% of all movie releases, so AMC, count down. Yes, you are going to show it. But they were mad that they felt cut out of that deal. So business models will change, opportunities and things will change. Uh, but I think, uh, I think a consistent thread will still be stories and connection to each other. Awesome. Thank you for that insight. Looks like we'll take one last question here from Charlie. Uh, if you want to unmute. Go ahead. Yep. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Thank you for coming what in. The, what is ISU, Charlie? Uh, Iowa State. Iowa State. Go yep. Buckeyes. Uh, the other one. <laughs> the other one. Go Buckeyes. But I, I don't, I don't care about sports. Um, <laughs> so, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for talking about this. Mm -hmm. So, just to put um, a wrap on this all thing and sort of uh, give us a, a clearer call to action at the end of this. Um, First off, for all the students, uh, make sure that you are uh, on the Discord because we're going to have more stuff like this, as well as there are already groups coming together to figure out um, group projects and study groups for certifications and other exams and other things that we can come away after this summer with some um, professional improvement. But um, a big thing that you know many of us do and now is a great time to do more of is personal projects and sort of you know, building things and trying to show off our technical skills. So MK, when it comes to these projects, it can be a lot easier than trying to come up with something completely brand new to sort of build off an existing idea or IP. So is that okay? No, no, no. Thank you, my little plant, Charlie, for asking that question. Never already, nope, nope. Um, so first of all, Attraction Magazine is hosting a pitch fest May 29th. And so, and if any of you have an idea, like I know that UCSD hosted a design, a haunted house design contest recently, you can pitch that idea at this pitch fest. Um, or you can just go and watch other professionals pitch and you'll learn how to pitch things. Um, so there's opportunities for you to work. There's lots of, lot, there's some contests out there, Ryerson, um, Cornell, Imagineering, UCSD have themed entertainment design competitions, which is a great way to get stuff in your portfolio. Volunteer where you fall to work for a haunted house and get some stuff. Um, but never ever put IP in your portfolio because we're not allowed to look at it. I won't look at mine because then I could be accused of stealing your original creative idea. And so to protect myself, I shut it and I hand it back to you. It could be your best project or your best project could be on the one then on the next page and I will shut it. And also out of respect for my competition, I won't look at a Scooby-Doo haunted house either. So if you have the world's best Star Wars idea, just make it space theme, right? Just don't use existing characters because it is heartbreaking to not. Now, will any major company ever sue a 21 year old? Probably not. Um, but years and years ago for the imagination student design competition, we did have a student do a little mermaid themed ride and they were posting online that it was their original idea. Tokyo Disneyland actually had mermaid in development years before and they filed the cease and desist. The kid had to take it down because it was not his, he had he put it up and said, this was a pitch for a student design contest and we give you the verbiage to say that, that would have been fine. But he insisted on saying it was his original idea and inspired Tokyo, which it did not. Um, yeah, so just be smart about that. And also 
you, like you said, you can build upon things, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the story. It can be, we all know what a dark ride is, right? We all know what small world is, right? That works. Don't recreate it. Do like what the next generation thing would be. And because we all have the shared vocabulary of um, what small world is. Um, I, I get it. I know exactly what, where you're coming from. Your audience is pretty smart. And so they'll get it. All right. Thank you so for all here, the questions. Here's my final story about a story. And this is going to make you, this will make you cry a little. So maybe put your camera off if you don't want to tell to see you crying. And I'm sorry, Charlie, it was the other Ohio, Ohio State. Um, so they have a beautiful brand new football field. And it's right next to a super tall building. So the people on the top floor of that building have a beautiful unobstructed view every Saturday of the football games. And that building happens to be a children's hospital. Um, and so every Saturday, um, they've decided at the end of the first quarter, 80,000 people, band, fans, team, coaches, refs, all turn and wave to the kids and everybody cries their eyes out because little kids will say on Wednesday, I'm pretty sure I can live till Saturday so I can watch the game. That's a big freaking deal, right? And so it's funny because when they started doing it, which was not, not this past fall, but the a fall ago, ESPN immediately said, one of the most beloved traditions. And they're like, wait, it's not a tradition if you did it once. So then the second week, they're like, now, one of the most beloved traditions. Um, and it did win an ESPN Spirit Award as the most moving, thoughtful, considerate thing. And it's free. You know, you can connect people. You can tell stories. You can tell those kids that you care. Lots of children's hospitals do this. Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. Everybody flashes your night at lights at bedtime at 8 p.m. Every business in the city flashes their lights and says good night. It's called the good night lights. And again, free. Um, so there's lots of ways to tell what your little story is and connect. And by the way, if you Google these videos, <sighs> waterproof mascara. Um, there's some really great stuff happening with window washers getting dressed in Halloween costumes. And, you know, Spider-Man is washing your window or Superman. They're still doing their job. You're still being a patient on the other side. But that really matters to a child that Spider-Man waved and free. So there's expensive things, a la Galaxy's Edge. And there's freebies, a la Fiona, or Fiona the Hippo, or just waiting. So if you had questions that you didn't get to, please email them to me. Um, I will either email those back to you. If there's anything that I think Jacob should share wider, I'll CC him on it. And um, I have topics, you know, obviously beyond this and resources. So um, just let me know how I can be a service. All right. Thank you so much, MK. Give her a Zoom round of applause. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't have any peep. But Kid President says, thanks for having us. <laughs> All right, so look forward to next Thursday. We'll be having another one of these focused around sketching 101 um, and learning some of those skills for helping visualize uh, ideas you might have rapidly and sharing them with uh, teammates they may have in any project. Um, join the Discord link um, and then feel free to shoot an email to mk or to tea at nd.edu if you have questions about the summer skill sessions at all. Uh, if there's no other questions, thank you and uh, have a good Thursday night.